Hello everyone and welcome back to Everlasting Summer. Last time we were here, Simeon nearly crushes Slavia, we give Lena a private dance, and we somehow lose Shurik. As well as, I'm pretty sure we're going to have a beach episode this time. I'm going to see how that's going to go. Come on, let's swim. I don't want to. Maybe later. I was not a fan of swimming. Suit yourself. The girls ran into the water. Why did I come here? Why am I not out looking for answers? Because you are procrastinating. Should I care about it now? So if you don't know, seem normal. Certainly, a lot of strange things have happened to me during these three and a half days, but not one of them taken separately seemed at all supernatural. Especially since I didn't get any closer to finding so much as a clue. On the contrary, everything that has happened has only confused me more. What alternatives do I have? I won't get any truth from the local residents, though I doubt they even know it. Should I try to leave this place? But how far can I walk considering I don't even know where I am? It turns out that my only option is to wait. After some time, the girls came back. Uliana held something in her hands. Look! I looked up and saw a crawfish. Crayfish? Just a normal crayfish. Okay, then. I knew we were going to get a booty shot eventually. I'm pretty sure this is one of the ones that showed in the little cinematic. I just didn't realize how weird it was going to be. <laughs> For me, it's weird. Just this full-on booty so close. Oyana lay next to me and started to torment it. Leave the poor animal alone. Why? It's just a crayfish. So what? It has a right to live, too. I'll rip- oh my goodness gracious. I'll rip its claws off and ask the cook to boil it for for dinner. As if we have any- we have nothing else to eat. I looked at Alyssa. She seemed to be totally uninterested in Oliana's fun with the poor sea creature. Tell her. What's wrong? It's a crayfish. It deserves it. It looks like the girls missed their lessons on nature in primary school and lacked empathy for the environment. Give it. I snatched a crayfish from Oyana. Oyana. Suit yourself. I was a little surprised she didn't resist. I looked into the eyes of the poor animal. They didn't express anything at all, but I thought that if I, if it could speak, it would certainly be outraged. Maybe it would even go to the UN Convention of Human Rights. To tell the truth, I wasn't sure that would help. I took the crayfish to the river and set it free. Is this a river? This thing's huge. It's a huge river. Never mind. I'll catch more. There's plenty of them here. Said Oyana. No doubt about it. I mumbled. Time passed and I was getting sleepy. Don't fall asleep, don't do it. <gasps> I fell asleep. I don't remember what I was dreaming about, if I was dreaming at all, but I woke up when someone shook my shoulder. Whoa. Olga Demetrina stood next to me. An interesting swimsuit to wear at a camp. Did you come to swim too? Also has unnecessary collar, but what else? I asked, still half asleep. No. It's almost time for lunch, and we still can't find Shurik. What then? Why are you? Why are you in a swimsuit then? I'm so confused. 
Are, are you just giving me fan service right now, lady? The leader said, standing before me in a wet swimsuit. And? I want you to look for him. Seems like I'm the only pioneer in this entire camp. I was sincerely outraged. Every time I was getting clear that Olga Dimitrina considered me her errand boy to be used like a slave. Or vice versa. If I came to you, then I want you to help me. Why exactly me? However, after giving it some thought, I decided to agree. After all, my shoulders and back got sunburned while I was sleeping and searching for Shurik, would let me get acquainted with unexplored locations of the camp. Okay. It was not exactly right to wander around wearing only swimming trunks, so I should get changed first. Ten minutes later, I stood outside Olga Dimitrina's cabin, deciding where to go. Oh my god. We can we can go here. We have like three options. Bus stop, boat house, and over here. I'm clicking here because what even is this place? But it's still a stupid idea. If Shurik was hiding anywhere in the camp, he would have been found by now. Of course, assuming he wants to be found. So I hardly think I can help him. What? Are you serious? I'm so done with your... Your inability to want to do things. That you started off... On a good note, and then you... Immediately petered off into not caring again. I feel like this is just to get back at me for saying no in a stupid dream. <laughs> Together with this thought, I entered the cabin and stretched myself on the bed. Nothing good will happen if Olga Dimitrina finds me here. Stop. Enough. Am I just some trembling creature, or do I have rights? I didn't want to do anything anyway. The day was just as hot as the previous ones, and the only thing to do was to stay in bed and wait for lunch. I'm upset because I just want to find Shurik. I was just falling asleep when somebody knocked on the door. Come in. Slavia stood at the doorstep. Olga Dimitrina isn't here, is she? No. And what are you doing? She asked with suspicion. I looked over myself, lying on the bed, and said, I'm lying down. I can see that. But I heard Olga Dimitrina ask you to find Shurik. Well, yeah. And? What's the point? I'm sure she already turned the whole camp upside down. Not much time has passed, why should we panic? You know, stuff could happen. Slavia looked at me thoughtfully. Get up. Do I have to? I was so worn out that even the thought of going somewhere frightened me. Yes, you do. Worn out? Why? Why are you worn out? You haven't done anything. Slavia is not a person who I can ever say no to. I stood up reluctantly and went out of the cabin with her. We stood at the doorway for some time, relaxing in the beams of the summer sun. Though I was rather crying. Where, where shall we start? Where shall we start? We have to look everywhere. Great idea, just great. Shut up, Simeon. You wouldn't even go to the place that I wanted to go to. The first stop on our route was the library. Slavia went to Xenia, sitting at the table, and spoke to her. I just stood in the doorway. I didn't want to communicate with this librarian any, any more than necessary. A few minutes later, Slavi came back to me. So? Nothing. She shook her head. As, as expected. The canteen. We still had time before lunch starts, so there was no usual crowd of pioneers. 
It was empty inside and outside the building. While Slavia was talking to the cooks, I was sitting and playing with a salt shaker. Some salt spilled out of the pot. Certainly, I would be worried if I were superstitious. Strangely, strangely enough, he wasn't here either. It would be unexpected if she had found him, for instance, in the refrigerator. The next stop, according to our plan, was the infirmary. I decided not to go inside and waited outside for Slavia. No results. There were pioneers playing football on the sports ground. It would be hard for sure to get lost among them. Finally, we reached the clubhouse. You think he could be here? I think that's the first place people would have searched. Let's go in. Empty inside. Slavia opened the door and went to the next room. I followed her. This all seemed to, to me to be a stupid undertaking. This was strange, especially because it was Slavia's idea. I mean, I understand responsibility and so on, but isn't it obvious that he isn't in the camp? After all, he isn't play playing hide-and-seek, is he? No one here either. What did you expect? He'd be sitting in a closet? Well, it seems like I've offended her. Sorry, sorry, but seriously. I understand. But we have to check all possibilities. Okay, listen. What do you really think? About Shurik's disappearance? Yes. Maybe he went into the forest and has been caught by a forest spirit. She laughed at that. What a fabulous story. However, in this camp you never know. Yes, true that. But now isn't the time for jokes. Cheer up. We'll find him. I hope so. Slavia smiled. Well, I still have some things to do. See you later. She left, but I was standing there for some time staring at the cybernetics club closet. However, I was so inspired by Slavia's actions that I decided to continue searching somewhere else. Oh my god, we can go into the forest! It was obvious that Olga, Demetrina, and her pioneers have already searched every nook and cranny of the camp. Roamed the length and breadth of it. So probably it's not worth looking for Shurik in the canteen or on the beach. Or in the cybernetics club, it was his second home. Or maybe even his first. Thus it might be worth looking around the surrounding forest. I didn't plan to go far into the forest, otherwise it might be me who will they'll be looking for tomorrow. I didn't really visit the countryside often. I just stayed in a country house every summer during my childhood. But that but that one was very close to the city. But in this camp, it was possible to find everything I hadn't seen for so long. Overwhelming vegetation, singing birds, and fresh air. I found a meadow and sat on a stump. How peaceful this place is. But where, where in the world is Shurik? Actually, he could have been taken against his will. This camp is far from normal, so pioneer disappearances should not be all that strange. An intriguing possibility. Could it be the work of whichever force sent me here? Or is it just some s separate local entity's doing? Actually, I was also thinking about that. Like, what if whatever brought him here decided to take Shurik out or something? I don't know, like Shurik did something to just return home? Who knows? Lost in my thoughts, I didn't notice how the grass before me started moving. I looked closely and saw a squirrel. It approached me carefully and stared at my hands. Probably used to getting fed here. Sorry, friend. I don't have anything with me. Of course, the squirrel could not understand me and continued to just sit there waiting for treats. I felt sorry for it because I didn't have even a crumb of bread in my pocket. 
I realize that I'm even ashamed to look it in the eyes and decide to move on. I would be too. Though not so much ashamed, more like guilty. Guilty. After some wandering, I came to the washstands. Turns out that he's not in the forest either. At least not in the surrounding area. And going further was just frightening. I walked to the washstands, took off my shirt, and tried to wipe myself down because I was all sweaty. However, it wasn't so easy. I would be able to get into the washbowl and there's even... I won't be able to get into the washbowl and there isn't even a ladle. Suddenly, I heard footsteps from behind. I turned around. Electronic was walking in my direction. Looking for Shurik? Yeah. You too? Me too. Listen, you know him better. Where could he have gone? I don't have a clue. He answered sadly. Well, I just don't understand why everyone has made such a fuss. During the night, wasn't he in the cabin with you? Then he can't have been gone for too long. Maybe he went for a walk? You don't know Shurik, said Electronic excitedly. He's fanatically dedicated to his work. His life consists of robotics and cybernetics. People like him are one in a million. No, in a billion. His talent is boundless. I look up to him. He's a man of steel. No, simply triumphant. At that moment, he looked like Hitler making a speech in front of a crowd of thousands. Oh, okay. Way to make a comparison. Even his gestures matched. Okay. So what? So what? You don't understand, do you? No. He spends all of it, you see. All of his free time in her club. All. So disappearing just like that is unusual for him? Of course. Seems like electronic calm down. Okay. He looked at me intently. Are you going to wash? Not really. Just rinse off a little. It is hot. Me too. He looked around. I wish there was a bucket or a ladle, something to get more water with. Yeah, I noticed already. Then let's do this. He walked behind the washstand and pulled on one of the taps. To my surprise, its end turned up and rather than pouring into the wash bowl, the water splashed up at 90 degrees. You could manage to wash yourself that way. <laughs> Dang, when did Electronic get some plump ass lips? Meanwhile, Electronic took his shirt and then squatted so it seemed like he pulled down his shorts. <laughs> I took it. It's so funny. I couldn't really tell because the wash standing was behind concealed him up to his waist. He directed the stream towards himself and started to sing something quietly. Oh my god. And the, and the sexy music playing in the background. Let's clean my chimney, chimney sweep. I stood astonished not knowing what to do. He seemed to notice. I'll wash myself and then let you use it. Gosh, I got such a massive chill. Well, you know, I just remember that I have something to do, gotta go. Out of all the eccentricities <laughs> of electronic, the moment I just saw was the weirdest one. Hey, what's up with you? Cold shower on, a, on such a hot day is like the best thing ever. No, 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 no. That won't do. And anyway, I have to go. Lately, these sentences have been missing the periods. I put on my shirt quickly and ran back into the forest. I wasn't going to deal with that. Not, not now. I wonder what's got into him. That wasn't something I was planning on. I swear I'm not gay. I went for lunch with mixed feelings. I could not stop seeing electronic in my mind, with a sense of accomplishment and with a realization of time wasted. Accomplished what? What did you do? Nothing? The canteen was crowded. I couldn't stay unnoticed. Olga Demetrina called me. 
Simeon, come with us. The camp leader, Slavia, and Electronic were sitting at the four-seat table. I nodded and went to get my food. This time I had to spend several minutes in the queue. Today's menu didn't really differ from the other day's menus. The dishes looked the same, at least. When I sat at the table and wished Bon Appetit to everyone, Olga Dimitrina said, So what are you thinking? About what? We searched for Shurik all around. It's noon and he's nowhere to be found. I took a note of the rhyme, but didn't want to point it out. Now's not the time. We looked all over the camp. I went all around the neighboring forest. Olga Dimitrina looked at me. And I... helped too. We must call the police. Maybe we should wait until the evening? I asked lazily. Maybe he went home? That can't be. Shirk lives thousands of miles away. By train? The nearest station... She paused. It's far off. Now it was getting interesting. Every time the conversation reached the point concerning a way they could leave Sophie Nook, all the camp inhabitants started changing the subject. How far is far? Really far. The camp leader looked at me, indicating with her expression that asking more questions was not advised. So we should go deeper into the forest. Maybe he got lost. Sure, always takes a compass. Chimed in electronic. I wonder what else could be found in his magic vest, assuming he has one. If I were to get lost in the forest, a compass. If I were to get lost in the forest, a compass would be of no real use. Police. We should call the police in the evening. Not right now, at least. Okay, so you'll do it later. They were silent. We should be able to find them before evening. We still have time. If he actually got lost, we have no time to lose. We cannot be sure. Then where is he? Where? There is some truth in the camp leader's words. Hiding the whole day just like that is suspicious. Why would he do that? Shurik seems to me to be quite a serious pioneer. Well, Yana would have been a better fit for this behavior. So there is so there is good reason to believe that he is gone. All that can be done has already been done. We'll just have to wait. Slavia, Electronic, and Olga Demetrina looked at me sorrowfully, but didn't say a word. I finished my lunch, took the tray back, and left the canteen. It's still the first half of the day. What now? The camp was drifting off for an afternoon nap. Only Genda stared at me through his glasses. Of course, he was staring somewhere else, but I had a feeling that he was constantly watching me. I bet he knows where Shurik is hiding. He just can't say anything. The disappearance of the cybernetics club leader made me think. Maybe it's got something to do with my case. Oh. Oh, Pioneer. The nurse stood in front of me. I looked at her curiously. Go and take my place in the infirmary. I have an urgent call. Somebody is injured. Me? Yes, you. Take the keys. The nurse threw the keys and ran away. Why me? Isn't there anyone else in this camp? What exactly should I be doing? What if something happens? Oh, what to do now? I missed my chances to refuse. Oh no, I scraped my knee. Well, I guess we're going to have to do surgery. What? I stood in front of the door uncertainly. On the one hand, there's nothing to worry about. I'll spend half an hour or so here and she'll be back. Well, what if someone comes for actual help? With a broken leg or a head injury? I begin to worry too much. I hope that there's no injuries more serious than bruises and scratches in this camp. I only know how to use band-aids and disinfectant. But at the same time, I cannot shake the idea that in a certain... In a, serious, in a serious situation, I'd be absolutely useless. I sit there crying. We are both crying. I don't even know how to perform CPR. 
The magazine on the nurse's table got my attention. A good way to relax, I guess. A magazine on how to do CPR. This is labeled Soviet fashion. The publication date or month were absent. However, this was not a surprise. There were much stranger things happening here. I didn't know much about Soviet magazines. Maybe they actually didn't have publication dates on them. Models dressed in old-fashioned clothes stared at me from the glossy pages. Nowadays, nobody would wear such clothes. I smirked. I wonder if Slavia, for example, considered this fashionable. I can only imagine what would happen if she appeared in my time wearing something like this. Imagine we were walking hand in hand and wearing my coat while- Why are you imagining this? I'm wearing my coat with a hood and she's dressed in a lavish dress covered with lace and things. Seems like I'm already imagining Slavia in my world. With me. And not only Slavia. This dress better suits Oyana. This cute Sarafan would look good on Alyssa. This skirt and cardigan would look nice on Lena. If only they could be real. No, I saw them, heard them, could even touch them. But still, they're here and I... I simply don't belong in this place. It's alien to me. I'm just waiting for a chance to get out of here. Waiting because nothing is up to me anymore. I sighed, put my head on the table, and fell asleep. I was awoken by the noise of the door opening. Lena stood at the door. The nurse isn't here? Then I'll come back later. I'm substituting for her. Since I'm responsible for, pi for pioneer lives, I should do it with full responsibility. Although, in fact, I was just afraid of something bad happening because of me. Any health complaints? I tried to give Lena the most professional smile I could in order to not confuse her. It was not a smile. At all. It was very bad. Nothing special. Just a little headache. Let's do this. Some painkillers, maybe. Of course, I wasn't aware where to find required medicine, so it took me a while to find them. Finally. I handed a... Metamucil tablet to Lena. Thanks. She smiled. That was completely unexpected and I lost touch with the reality staring at her. What? Lena turned awkward in an instant. Listen, I've been wondering. Do you like this? I don't know what got into me, but I grabbed that magazine from the table and showed her that picture of a skirt and a cardigan, which would really suit Lena in my opinion. Maybe I went completely nuts thinking about all the girls being in my world. Or maybe I wanted to distract myself instead of just waiting for the nurse to come back. Lena looked at the picture. Yes, I guess. Is stuff like this in fashion? I guess. She got confused and started blushing. Why do you ask? Really, why? I think he's a gorgeous in it. Just asking. We were quiet for some time. How's your headache? Much better, thank you. She smiled. I'll be off. Good luck. Lena went out and I continued to look through the magazine. After a while, somebody knocked on the door again. Seems like the infirmary is the most popular place to go. Suddenly, I decided to roleplay a nurse. Just the male version. Which is still a nurse and said, Come in. The door opened and Oliana entered the room. Wow. Did I miss the moment when you decided to start knocking? Anything wrong with me knocking? She frowned. Where does it hurt? Why on earth would I tell you? Where's the nurse? Right in front of you. I imposingly crossed my legs and looked questioningly at her. I'd better go. It'd be better to die than be treated by you. She smiled mischievously. You didn't even let me try. Oliana thought for a moment. Though you could give me some pills. What's bothering you? 
It took her some time to reply. A heavy stomach. Sure it's not an empty head. I muttered under my breath. What did you say? Nothing. Give me a second. I found the pills in the first drawer I opened. Thank you, doctor. She smiled cheerfully. Watching Oliana, I cannot imagine how such an optimistic and active child could have any health problems. Overdose of stolen candies, right? Got food poisoning from the canteen? Honestly, this overdose with stolen candies thing is... seems very legit. She would have stolen candy. She gave me a baleful look. No, I left everything for you. What? Oliana ran out of the infirmary and slammed the door. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Again, I went back to studying Soviet fashion trends. Time passed, but the nurse was still absent. I wasn't searching for Shurik. I wasn't looking for any clues concerning my situation. I was just sitting and flipping through a magazine. Just for a moment, I felt quite satisfied with the situation. So far, everything that has happened here could have been seen as just a trip to a summer camp, and if nothing changes anytime soon, then I can start worrying. You know, sometimes when Simeon says stuff, it makes him sound like a serial killer. Again, somebody knocked on the door. Did I miss the outbreak of an epidemic? Savia was standing at the doorway. Oh, hi. Isn't the nurse here? Hi. No, she's not here. I'm taking over for today. Great. I'd like... She hesitated. What? By the way, Simeon, Slavia said and looked intently at me. What? It seems like I lost my keys. Have you seen them anywhere? Sure I have. Yes, here. I found them near the canteen yesterday. I wanted to return them to you, but forgot about it. I was really bad at lying. My cheeks were red, my eyes were wandering around, and my hands were constantly shaking. I was just sweating buckets. Here. I was already preparing myself for an inappropriate scolding, but Slavia only took the heat and said, Thanks. So what have you come for? I really need to change the subject. Does anything hurt? No, it's nothing. Strange. I wouldn't even think that such an open person as Slavia would keep something quiet. If there's something bothering you, tell me. That's why I'm here, to treat people. I smiled widely. No. I mean, yes, but no. Hearing that made anything possible, even division by zero. So, how can I help you? You? I guess you can. She smiled and was going to leave, but suddenly stopped. However... Could you step out for a minute? Why not? Okay. I stepped out of the infirmary and leaned against the wall. I wonder what might she be doing, something that I can't even see. After a minute, the door opened and Slavia came out. She was carrying a small bundle. Is it tampons? I wasn't gonna ask because I wanted to be nice, but then I'm a nosy ass, so... What is it? Nothing. She blushed. Thank you. You're welcome. I guess. Slavia ran away. Seemed like I shouldn't have asked. Suspicious. I looked at the time. It was getting late. I'd read the magazine backwards and forwards, but the nurse still wasn't here. Jesus Christ. Suddenly the door burst open and Alyssa rushed inside. She looked at me piercingly. What are you doing here? Sitting. I admitted honestly. Okay then. It's even better without the nurse. 
she murmured. Are you sick? I asked acidly. Alyssa didn't answer and came closer to me. Move over. Why? So we can open the drawer. Isn't it obvious? What for? She got angry. None of your business. Do you two also need tampons? Well, I'm kinda in charge here. She gave it a moment's thought. Give me some active. Give me some activated carbon. Stomach cake? Yeah. She grinned sharply. I got the feeling there was something wrong here. Just because I don't like how first forceful you've been, I'm not going to give you the activated carbon. Really? A stomach ache? Really? Doesn't seem so. What? So I have to toss my lunch all over the place for you to believe me? I don't know what terrible things can be done with activated carbon, but I'm sure you'll think of something. She hesitated. And what if you're right? There. I knew it. Then I'm certainly not giving you anything. Alyssa tried to get to the drawers, but I blocked the pillbox with my chest like Alexander Mat M Matrasov was a Soviet infantry soldier during Great Patriotic War, posthumously awarded the title of the Hero of the Soviet Union for blocking German machine gun with his chest. Oh my god. That's intense. For all of her impudences, she was still just a girl and she had no chance of pushing me aside. Whatever. I'll find it somewhere else. She turned away and headed to the exit. At the door, Alyssa stopped and looked back. By the way, the camp leader and the nurse are carrying a pioneer with a broken leg. I really don't care, but they seem to be struggling. Yeah, sure. Come see for yourself. Alyssa seemed to be lying, but on the other hand, as long as I can see her. They came to the door and looked outside. No one was there. Er, uh, where exactly? They haven't reached here yet, then. She made a helpless gesture. Have fun. You're so dumb. So dumb, Simeon! I returned to the table and only then realized the one that one of the drawers was open. How did she make it so quick? I turned my back for just a second. Though, what evil can come from activated carbon? It was 15 minutes till dinner and the nurse still wasn't back. I guess just leaving the place like this won't do. She asked me to look after it after all. And who knows that... And who knows what might happen if I leave. Though who would want to steal anything from here? Except for Alyssa stealing activated carbon. I opened the magazine again and began flipping through it for the nth time. The fashions of the 80s weren't that fun anymore. Yawning got me several times. It was already 6 o'clock, so dinner had already started. Of course I had to be on the watch till the end, but my stomach seemed to have its own opinion on the matter. I stood up and steadily headed to the exit. A rustling sound came from behind the door. Could it be someone else who got poisoned, broke their arm, or something even worse? I sighed heavily and pulled the doorknob. However, there was no one out there. I immediately slammed the door. Seems it was just my imagination. I returned inside and instantly noticed that something had changed in the infirmary. To be precise, an apple had appeared on the table. Where from? Oh god, no. Bruce can't just materialize from thin air by themselves, can they? Though in this camp anything is possible. Chances are someone just brought it here. Maybe Lena wanted to thank me. Even that given that she's all shy and but wait. How could she just slip past me like that? Lena wouldn't climb through the window after all. So there must be something else. I was suddenly overwhelmed by fear. What if the apple was poisoned? What if there's a razor blade in it? Though why would someone complicate things when I'm here totally helpless and can be killed way more easily? 
You eat the apple and you turn into Snow White. You're just in a coma for forever. Or it might be the apple which Eve tasted in the Garden of Eden. In the case, I certainly shouldn't eat it. The same second my stomach reminded me it was there by rumbling treacherously. However, it would take time to close the infirmary to reach the canteen to get food. My stomach is about to eat itself. So dramatic. There's nothing wrong, I guess. Once again, I try to remember if this apple was here before. In the end, it must have appeared from somewhere. Maybe it got here through the window. The shutter was slightly open. So someone must have reached in and put it here. Nothing serious, however. I've been waiting for a moment like this to happen and I'm not gonna eat the apple. And when I mean I've been waiting, I've been, been waiting for him to just drop dead. No. Even assuming that this is a normal apple, in any case I shouldn't eat it un- I shouldn't eat unwashed fruits. Just like that. I found a reason for my fear and put the apple away. It was time to go for dinner. Along the way I ran into Electronic. How's it going? Did you find Shurik? No. Still no sign of him. Don't worry. I'll find him. I try to cheer him up. Too much time has passed. I'll just keep on searching. What about dinner? No, no. Finding Shrek is more important. He muttered thoughtfully. I left him at the crossroads and wished him good luck. Pioneers crowded in the doorway. I quickened my pace, trying not to be the last one in line, at least for today. And I was lucky. In the far corner was an absolutely empty seat. I took my dinner quickly and sat at the table. Tonight's dinner consisted of fruit soup and a pair of buns. This, this set surprised me at first, but the taste was actually nice. I concentrated on eating. Lena! Lena, let's go here. Look, three free chairs. Lena and Miku stood in front of me. Are these taken? Wondered Lena. No, take a seat. Of course, I wish you were alone. Thank you. As soon as Lena said that, Xenia jump, jumped out from behind her back. I'll sit here. There is no place left. She said, putting her tray on, on a table and sitting down, not even waiting for my answer. Sure, make yourself at home. I muttered sorrowfully. What? Nothing. To tell the truth, I wanted to reduce the whole company to just Lena, though neither Miku nor Xenia were causing much trouble. Oh, excuse you. Except one was too talkative and the other was too arrogant. But nevertheless, they were absolutely harmless, especially comparing to some others I could name. Oh, seems like I forgot my key. Don't worry, take mine. I was surprised by Miku's short reply. Do you... live together? Of course, didn't you know? Together, our cabin is the rear most. I mean, the furthest from here. I mean, the last one. I wouldn't even have been surprised if somebody told me that Lena lived with Slavia. Or with Xenia at worst. Even electronic. Excuse you. With Silent and Shy Lena excess and excessively talkative Miku as a pair, that's really a surprise. Did you find Shurik? It's strange that Xenia is disturbed by someone's problems. No. Surely he is at the village buying cigarettes. Or vodka. She snorted. Village. At that moment, the conversation got much more interesting. Got the problem with villages? Xenia looked amazed. I... <laughs> I don't know what's going on with Xenia's voice. You mean there's a village nearby? I think so, she said uncertainly. I looked at Lena and Miku, but they were busy with their meals and did not pay attention to our conversation. At least we're learning something. You mean, you don't know exactly? Well, why should I care? Zinya stared at her dish. Well, there must be something nearby. Listen. Listening? I don't know. Will you let me eat? Seems like I won't get anything from her. 
Though there's a chance that she really doesn't know. See, if you listen to the people just like this, then you know, maybe you'd learn, you would have learned some more, but you don't. You're so selective. The remaining time was spent listening to Miku talking about some nonsense. I was just going slowly mad in silence. Well, that was weird. <laughs> obviously, the first time I did after getting... Obviously, the first thing I did after getting out after that was inhale a great breath of fresh air. The sun was setting. I decided to take a walk. It's highly unlikely that I'll find anything more exciting to do for the rest of the evening. That way, something interesting could arise quite unexpectedly. Oh. I was approaching the square when I heard a loud bang. It seemed like something had exploded. I was paralyzed. I'm in a hostile environment, not knowing the rules and laws of this place. It would be better for me to run. But at the same time, I was curious. Probably I would just keep standing there, but somebody grabbed my hand. It was Olga Demetrina. Why are you standing here? Let's go and see what happened. Can't you ever manage without me? I begged her pitifully. It shouldn't be anything serious. I hope. When we came to the square, there was already a group of pioneers. At its center, a big UFO. Olga Demetra now vigorously pushed through the crowd and approached the crime scene. Obviously, someone had tried to blow up Genda. But the attackers failed, and the monument was still standing upright. There was only dim ash traces. There was only dim ash traces on the pedestal. Well, who did this? She looked over the crowd of pioneers. Surely it wasn't done by any organized terrorist organization. These guys all came here just to look at what happened. I noticed Ulyana and Alyssa in the crowd, and it looks like our camp leader noticed them too. You two, come here. They approached relu reluctantly. Why always me? If you think so. Show me your hands, Diftiskia. I don't... <laughs> Every time. What's wrong with them? I looked closer and saw that they were smeared in black. Now it's clear. What did you make a bomb with? The junior terrors seemed to hesitate over whether or not to confess, but then blurted out proudly. Active Cobbin? Salt Pep? Salt... Peter? Salt... Salt... Salt, pellet, whatever. And sulfur. Wait a minute. Carbon. Carbon that she stole from the first aid kit. Why exactly the monument? What did this honored man ever do to you, the fighter for the rights of... I could hardly imagine how long she would have kept on scolding Alyssa if Electronic hadn't popped out at the very moment, shouting. I found it! I found it! Everyone turned towards him. He held the boot in his hand. Here. Electronic boastfully shook it over his head. It's Shurik's boot. Okay, calm down. Tell us in detail where you found it. In the forest. On the way to the old camp. Whispers ran among the pioneers. Old camp. The old camp. Are you sure? Absolutely. What's so special about this old camp? I joined in the conversation. It's nothing special, really, she stammered. One of the Sovyanok legends tells the story of a young camp leader's ghost living there. She fell in love with the pioneer, but he rejected her, and so she killed herself. Well, that's dark. She committed Harakiri with a kitchen knife. Next day, that boy was hit by a bus. Oyana ran out of the crowd. Bus? I refrained from asking about the route number. But science doesn't acknowledge the existence of ghosts, so we have nothing to be afraid of. Anyway, somebody should go there. Then when the crowd started to thin out, they're like, nope, not me, bye. Olga Demetrina. It's almost night, maybe tomorrow? I turned around and saw Slavia and Lena. What if, at night, what if, at night, something happens to him? No, today, right now. By the way, where is this place? 
Electronic roughly described to me the directions and told me the story of the old camp. The camp leader looked at me attentively. If you think that I... You're the only man here. I looked around the area. Of course. Electronic was quick to flee. I still didn't want to walk in the woods alone. If he asked me, I would... Go with Alyssa, go with Slavia, go with Oyana, go with Lena. I'm going alone. Goodbye. <laughs> I'm out of here. Am I going there alone? Olga Demetrina looked thoughtful. Perhaps you're right. We'll go together tomorrow morning. Aw, I want to go by myself. We stood in silence for some time, then dispersed around the camp. Everybody seemed seemingly forgot about Alyssa and her terror sack, maybe due to the minor damage it caused. Together with the camp leader, I went towards our cabin. I tried to think of why Shurik would go to the old camp. He's interested in robots and cybernetics, not scary stories and ghosts. What does that boot have to do with that? With that? I remember how I decided to wait until something extraordinary would happen. And then I realized this is it. Olga Demetrina, I think I'll take a walk before bed. Just not a long one. Okay. I don't know why they didn't just go all together. He's missing a boot. Shouldn't that be a red flag? When I reached the square, I understood that hanging around in the forest for some other strange place may not be that scary. Oh, well, that was or not for. But doing so in the dark. I didn't want to return to Olga Demetrina's cabin, but I had to find a flashlight. For instance, there was one in the infirmary. I was glad I didn't spend my whole time there reading the fashion magazine. The flashlight was found quickly, and in a few minutes, I was again standing at the square, pulling myself together. I just had to make the final decision before I entered the forest. Moving past the pioneers' cabins down the forest path towards the abandoned camp. I set forth. Electronic told me that the old building was built immediately after the war. It looked like a kindergarten, or like a barrack, uh, or like barracks, I expected, and definitely could hold fewer pioneers than today's camp. It had been abandoned for about 20 years. It was now totally dark. The forest looked totally different at night. Mysterious shadows were hiding behind trees. Strange rustlings and the cries of night birds coming from everywhere. Branches treacherously snapping under my feet. The full moon was shining, so I decided to save the battery and the flashlight. I'm sure I will need it sometime soon. The further I moved, the more unpleasant thoughts came into my mind. I wasn't afraid of the dark at all. I didn't believe in ghosts and other mystical crap, but at the same time, during the last few days, I'd encountered so many incomprehensible phenomena that, against my own will, I started to read between the lines of the simplest things. Obviously, I felt exceptionally uneasy in the forest at night. Everywhere I looked, every shadow, every tree or bush looked like weird creatures escaping straight from horror movies or from S Stephen King novels. A branch seemed to be someone's hand, eager to grab my... A branch seemed to be someone's hand, eager to grab your shoulder, a fallen log, someone's dead body, someone who failed to get out of the forest. In every gully, I saw a bottomless abyss. If I had found myself in this forest under any other circumstances, without all the buses and pioneer camps, of course I would still feel uncomfortable, but then I'd be able to explain everything with logic and be afraid of nothing except for owls and mice, of course. But at the moment, there was more than enough reasons to fear. Despite all this, I reached the old camp without any adventures. Holy crap, that is too spooky for me. In a little glade, surrounded by trees, stood a house resembling a kindergarten. Paint peeled off the walls. Almost all the windows were broken. Broken masonry here and there. Holes in the roof that looked like those made by bombing. In front of the building was a little garden surrounded by a rusty fence. Apparently once it was a playground with a merry-go-round, swing, slides, and other Soviet attractions. But time is cruel. 
All of them were broken and mutilated by corrosion. The grass was so tall that it almost came up to my waist. The moon looked down from behind the clouds and illuminated the old camp. It seemed like everything came back to life. Windows shone with new glass and walls looked like they'd been painted with fresh paint. I heard playful laughter and then immediately turned around and fucking ran for it. <laughs> Saw translucent children joyfully running and frolicking in the yard, a strict camp leader on the threshold, holding a basket with ripe apples in her hands. The old cleaning lady taking a nap in the shade. I sent chills down my spine. Of course, my imagination was just playing tricks, but the old camp itself was so similar to all the post-apocalyptic pictures I had seen that these visions were no surprise. I stood undecided for a long time before I dared to go further. You know, I was expecting a longer beach episode and not... freaking scary, scary, scary. <laughs> After all, I'm here to find Shurik. Though I still don't get what he might be doing here. If he even is here. A boot somewhere nearby doesn't mean anything. However, if he was not eaten by wolves, for some reason it seemed like there was there were no wolves in this forest. This must be the only place where he might be hiding. I carefully crossed the yard, pushing the tall grass apart and trying not to bump into jagged pieces of metal. But I stopped in a doorway, hesitating. An impenetrable, heavy darkness stared back at me from inside. Even the bright moonlight could not illuminate any object or even highlight a silhouette, so I just scream into the building. Shurik! Shurik, please! My head was filled up with different thoughts that all said that it's better for me to not go any further and run away quickly. But I pulled myself together, turned on the flashlight, and stepped over the threshold. Inside the building looked like a typical kindergarten. I still remember my childhood days, and so everything here looked very familiar. Sleeping room with lines of beds standing close to each other, a large playroom, toilets, a dining room, and utility rooms. Signs of past children's joy were seen everywhere. From time to time, the flashlight drew my attention to a decaying doll, or a plastic toy car, or a punctured, or a punctured rubber ball, or a broken rank of tin soldiers. There was a book on a table faded with age. I flipped through a few pages. It was a story I had read long ago back in my childhood. Something about the war. Enemies destroyed the kindergarten and all of its kids hid in the little basement together with a bunch of adults while bombs were exploding up on the surface. I don't remember the end of the story, but as far as I remember, nobody died. Looking at the illustrations, all the emotions, fear, sadness, sympathy for the poor children, and the sense of hopelessness which I had experienced which I had experienced while reading this book came over me. It's strange that under exactly these conditions right here and now that I found this book. Probably there's somebody who manages this ongoing story, who writes the scenario for this absurd play, who sews costumes for the local pioneers and creates sets like this abandoned camp. To tell the truth, he's very talented. Attention is paid to even the most minor details. Although this place was abandoned long ago, everything, he's, everything here seemed to be untouched. Of course, time didn't spare this camp. In so many years, I had often been visited by the locals. A perfect place for young people just hitting puberty. They could drink alcohol, indulge in amorous pleasures, or simply burn everything down just for fun. Electronic mentioned this place is full of legends. Legends of ghosts and devils living here. Shurik, please! I don't want to be here anymore. Time for your... Take, for example, the story about the camp leader who committed suicide. In my world, nobody would be. In my world, nobody would. The. In my world, nobody would believe that this could stop. That this could stop somebody. In this reality, anything is possible. Certainly, the fear didn't disappear, but I decided that since I'd come here, I was going to carry on to the end. The building was small, so it wasn't difficult to search it completely. But I didn't find any signs of Shurik. Maybe I should just call out to him? But on the other hand, maybe that's not such a good idea. Frustrated, I sat on a bench in the lobby and sighed. What, so sitting there... Doing nothing's a good idea, but not calling for him? Ghosts, where are you? Really, is that what you want? I asked the camp. And all of a sudden I noticed a strange depression in the corner. 
a small trap door, an adult would barely be able to squeeze through it, and it seemed to me that it had been recently opened as the dust was cleared around it. And so here's the part where I need to be scared. So, sure, it went somewhere. What might be lurking beneath the trap door? A basement? Would, what would he be doing there? Oh, Jesus Christ, it scared me. I pulled open the hatch and pointed the flashlight into the darkness. There was a ladder going down a couple of meters, ending in a concrete floor. Con concrete floor. There was a low, narrow corridor disappearing in the darkness. I hesitated for a long time. On one hand, I had no desire to go down there, but on the other hand, if Shurik was really there, I screamed into the hatch. <laughs> Shurik! Shurik, are you down there? I swore loudly and began to descend. This sucks. I was all made up of confidence. <laughs> and now what? I'm scared. <laughs> Downstairs it was so dark that even the flashlight didn't help much. A low ceiling, wires extending along the walls, broken lamps clad in iron bars. Jeez, don't do that to me. You, this is the second time. You don't have any eyes. This just makes it worse. I've all, I've seen it all somewhere. I slowly started to move deeper into the dungeon. The path went down and after a few dozen meters ended in a stairway with high steps. Soon I found myself in front of a massive metal door. Oh god. There was a sign painted on it. I looked closely and realized that it was a biohazard sign. No wonder. If the old camp was built after the war and it lasted until the 70s? So it's an ordinary bomb shelter and there's nothing to be afraid of. However, those thoughts made me even more scared. I made deci a decision and opened the door. <laughs> Loud noises. <laughs> Which immediately shut with a sharp sound as soon as, I, as soon as I stepped through the doorway. I peed just a little bit. <laughs> oh, God. I shuddered strongly. My hands began to tremble and my vision dim. The, sm <laughs> the smell of pee making me more terrified. I regained consciousness after a few seconds, and only then did I realize that apparently a strong spring was attached to the door. I found myself in a quiet, spacious room. In the beam of the flashlight, I could see a bunk bed, some cabinets along the walls, and several devices of, un of unknown purpose, located in the far corner. It seemed that this bomb shelter has never been used. Nobody ever came here. The beds were made. Which is strange in itself. I carefully looked around the room several times. The cabinets were filled with gas masks, chemical protective suits, dry rations, various domestic odds and ends. The devices which I at first could, be, could determine the purpose of were gauges of radiation, air pressure, and temperature. In short, it was a typical bomb shelter. I had never seen in such a place before, but it was how I had imagined it. The only thing that remained unexplored was the door at the other end of the room. I pulled the handle, but the door remained closed. If someone recently came down here, and he wasn't found in this room, then it would be logical to assume that he was behind this door. I called out in a whisper. Shurik? Shurik, are you there? No reply. Shurik, please. This isn't funny anymore. Maybe he locked himself out. But why? It was unclear what I should do next. Perhaps it would be smarter to come back tomorrow with help, but for some reason I had a feeling that behind this door I would find answers that I can't wait to be that can't wait to be found. I walked across the room and took a crowbar from the corner. I wedged it under the bottom of the door and tried to rip it from its hinges. Oddly enough, after a while I did just that. Fortunately it wasn't as massive as the previous door. Ugh. The door gave out and slammed onto the floor. I took a deep breath and pointed the flashlight down the passage. Oh god, more corridor. The corridor vanished in the darkness, the same as the one on which the same as the one on which brought me here. The walls were closing in, my head almost touched the ceiling, but I could not make out the end of the corridor. I walked carefully, looking at the ground, 
This was the reason that I did not fall into the pit. So, the hole was about a meter and a half in diameter, and there was earth at the bottom of it instead of concrete. It seemed that the hole was caused by an explosion. It wasn't too deep. I could easily climb out later. Oh my god. After I jumped into the hole, I found myself in something that resembled an old mine. The walls and the ceiling were reinforced with wooden beams. The tunnel was so far... The tunnel was so long that my flashlight was insufficient. A few minutes later, I found myself at the crossroads. It's too dangerous to go any further, I could get lost. I decided it would be a good idea to somehow mark the place from which I would begin my journey into the labyrinth, so I picked up a stone and made, uh, made quite a big notch on the wall. So. Oh, no. We'll stop here. <laughs> oh my goodness. This went from unusual camp, possible romance, to hello, scary things are happening and you have no choice but to continue forward. I mean, it's my fault. I, I chose to go by myself instead of taking somebody with me. But considering I've had no real want of being with anyone... I just wanted to go by myself. <laughs> See how things go about. And you know what? They're really good at making things look really scary. Because I, th I thought the infirmary was scary. This freaking abandoned camp is the scariest thing. <laughs> and then going through all of this stuff. This is like the only time Simeon's finally done something beyond walking around and eating. Anyway, I really thought the, the beach part was going to be a little longer, but it was very short, especially considering I already did a bit of it from last video. And then there was a weird area with Olga when, and her in the swimsuit, but she's asking, you know, for sure, I can, that just threw me off. Um, I, I really hope we find Shurik. This is really weird, and I hope that wasn't his boot, cause then that would mean, like, he lost his boot and he came all the way down here, or something? I wonder what we're gonna find. Maybe a way to get back home, or something still pretty scary, or it's just Shurik and he's building another robot somewhere above something. But this is really odd considering, because there's... This is really deep down. It's the camp, then you have the bomb shelter, and it's corridors, and then you have, underneath that, you have this mine shaft. We are not suited <laughs> to be going through this. And I'm, I'm really excited to see what happens. Because it is horrifying. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. And I hope you have a good day and a good night. Shurik. Shurik, buddy, please be okay. This isn't goodbye. We're gonna find you.